Blessings and welcome back everyone to our third in 36 as we move through the zodiacal faces of the zodiac. I'm here joined once again with David Fisher and Katie Dayton. Thank you both for being here again. So I hope you all had a very golden Aries 2. So let's jump right into Aries 3 if y'all don't mind. Do you mind if we do that? Yeah, let's go. Cool. So Aries 3, uh, Austin calls it the burning rose. Uh, we've got T. Susan Chang calling it beauty weds the architect. And that, I guess, comes to be a part of the, the, the title as we have the emperor that's gone through both of the decans with us. We now have the empress joining and she comes in in her bodily form as Venus. So Venus rules Deccan three of Aries, um, hence the burning rose. Um, what I kind of wanted to say about this before we dive in is just this idea of Venus desiring or inspiring some kind of action um, within that Mars archetype. Venus now, as we are going, as we are recording this, just uh, entered her exaltation in the sign of Pisces and she's in co-presence with Jupiter. So you might end up feeling that with this Deccan, like a, like a lifting of the heart or like a little bit more desire, inspiration, something like this. Um, <clears throat> because Venus will be now hearkening in the next three decans, and this time not as a sub ruler, shall we say, uh, just ruling the decan, but Venus rules Taurus. So she will be ruling the next three decans as we move through Taurus one, two, and three. So I just thought that was really, uh, you know, interesting to point out off the jump that you might be feeling that. Yeah, despite the fact that um, technically Venus is in debility in Aries, you were going to be feeling lots of positive Venusian things, I think, this year. Um, and that can include a lot of different keywords. There's a lot of natural significations for Venus. Um, maybe we could talk about a couple of those you know, issues that have to do with the feminine, issues that have to do with women, aesthetics, beauty, art, um, social harmony and cohesion are Venusian things. Uh, so just look for those over this next decade. Yeah, it really kind of brings in the social aspect of, you know, friendship or just kind of what would inspire us to lead or like once we've conquered, once we've once we lead, like what comes next? It sort of comes this desire for friendships, alliances, and something more, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Venus really brings that in. Let me go ahead and I'll just read a few things that I've picked out from my notes from Austin's 36 Faces um, and see if we can kind of open up bringing in that, that mood. <clears throat> In this space, we see the power of art to overcome hostility. We've got the dancer, the stand-up comedian, and the lecturer whose, whose kind of gifts are there to um, charm this hostile audience. The third decan extends uh, outward to, in a more social direction, like we were just saying. It has the power of the spirit to unify and seduce. It's a remarkable potency, Austin says. Um, here it creates a commonality of spirit to even the most hostile conditions. He says, I'll directly quote um, a few sentences. In love's battlefield, once the friction and fire of the first conjunction with their terror and elation have subsided, the lamp of raw passion burns low a less volatile fuel is required for the flame to continue on. I thought that was cool as we reflect on the last two decades prior. Um, it, he goes on to tell a story uh, coming from the fragments of this Hellenistic text called the 36 Heirs of the Zodiac. Um, and he talks about a story with Eros, um, how Eros is Eros, 
pierce to the heart of God and humans alike, setting each aflame with desire. I just thought that was a little fun harken back to the arrows, the three arrows that we saw in the last second. So um, I highlighted it there. And a direct quote again, um, there are peak experiences here, inspiring union amidst life's greatest struggles. Yet the one who walks these scenes must understand that these experiences do not promise anything of the future. And in fact, it's part and parcel of their glory. The rose shines most brightly when it's on fire. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love it. I mean, all the associations that you brought up with uh, Venusian topics, I feel like they're challenged within this deck and specifically they appear as challenged uh, 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 facets of that, of those particular topics that you guys listed and everything that you guys are saying. Um, and it's the, um, I think, because the imagery that you will see later in other um, sources that we we're going to bring up as well, you have some conflict shown. You have some of this, um, it's different than the, the other two, where you had uh, undisputed power and undisputed loyalty, undisputed uh, terrain and all of that, and strength. In this one, actually, the proposal is the complete opposite almost. Like you will try to achieve the same, the same amount of power, you will have the same kind of vision, but you will have to consider uh, the collective, you'll have to consider the, um, um, uh, the things that the sun and Mars don't like to consider, you know, that are other people and other opinions, other um, uh, points of view and things like that. They have a weight in what's manifested through this decan and should be listened to. Um, we kind of referenced this last time, or I think you did, David, about how, you know, yeah, it came from two masculine signs into now this feminine sign. And by its nature, the feminine is the many, right? It's having to take into account the will of the many, which the collective is a great word for that. Yes, yeah, socialization and uh, even, yeah, friendship, like Venus is friendship, right? And so you've got Mars, who's kind of like the, the breaker, the splitter, and then Venus asking for friendship. And it's almost like you could turn to that Mars decan and then the sun. It's like, no one's going to want to consecrate or consummate like this marriage between the emperor and the empress, right? If that emperor isn't something worthwhile to sort of trust that you can build something good with and build good alliances and build friendships and all of this stuff. So I think that's where, you know, like you both were saying, Venus in her debility here is, yeah, going to represent more of that um, fluctuation in that archetype as well as the challenges to those archetypes that we sort of want to rise up and see if we can embody or fulfill or bring to the table on some level. Yeah, yeah Venus is trying to make stability and harmony through consensus, right? And if you have that manifesting in a, 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 a decanic image uh, that manifests in, 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 its phys in physical forms in this world, um, within the sign of Aries, which is this splitting sign, this divergence, uh, or rather rebellious sign, um, you have uh, that harmony question, and why can't we have harmony, right? Uh, when a planet is denied a lot of its own resources, then it becomes this question, or it becomes this question of why? Why am I lacking this? Why am I lacking that? And, and trying to compensate for that in a way so and it generates a very potent kind of dynamic like it, it yeah very, it's, yeah yeah it's like the archetypal lovers almost it, yeah. it can be yes. like passion inflamed and desire and all these things but it can also be just like lovers quarrels and the idea of like uh, maybe even like one archetype subordinating to the other, which is obviously causing problems. And um, what else is I going to say about that? 
Well, it also is like the, it's the makeup or breakup story, classic makeup and breakup, like over and over again. Um, and that is the way the balance is kept <laughs> by going to the extremes between Venus and Mars like that. Um, and, you know, I, I hear everything that you just said, but another really strong keyword for this is just straight up sexy. <laughs> just yeah, straight up Venus and I Mars mean, together is sexy as hell. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely can be. But we all know like what passionate love affairs can be like. They can be short lived and amazing or they can be living past their prime and be <laughs> difficult or, you know, so but it is it is it is sexy. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say is. So if Mars is unbridled and then we've got bringing in the sun with some consistency, like David was saying before, like that, that kind of order that you can trust with the sun's rhythms, then again, you've got Venus that maybe can build on that at its highest ideal, right? Like she wants, like David was saying, to build harmony and, and goodwill and something dependable and trustable in order to build those like um, social and race, relational um, harmonies. You know, so um, maybe the sun hearkening in builds a bit of a bridge for her to be able to work with this de Deccan. So that being said, T. Susan Chang talks about um, this at length, and maybe that's a good time to pass it over to you, KD. We can start to move on to the tarot. Um, here we've got this Lord of Perfected Work or the Completion. So would you want to maybe guide us through um, starting there? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll go ahead and read that first sentence of um, Chang's chapter here on Aries 3. She says, the final decade of Aries arrives with a welcome taste of fire roasted, honey glazed, coppery sweetness after the grip of martial iron in the Aries 1 and the blaze of solar gold in Aries 2. Venus gracefully descends to hold court here for 10 days. So I really love the depiction of Venus with those luxurious, um, luxurious treats that she rules. Um, it's very rich, I think, language there that we have for Venus ruling this decan. So, oh, he Susan Chang, her words just drip with this one. She's I know, just like I know. really lavish with the honey copper. Like I love it. Beautiful, beautiful writer, um, and thus we highly recommend the book. Um, but I have here a spread of the three cards um, that are related to Aries three. They, uh, they are the card of Venus, which is the Empress, the card of Aries, which is the Emperor, and then the specific minor arcana card for this Deccan, which is the Four of Wands. Um, Chang goes into this a lot in her chapter about how there is a power dynamic between the emperor and the empress on multiple different levels. But an interesting one that I wanna talk about right here is that uh, the card of Venus is a card associated with the planet and the card of Aries is a card associated with the sign. So, so they're representing different things here. So they are not on equal footing. Um, and there are a few other ways in which they're not on equal footing too, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but this order of cards here is also significant because on either side, on the left and on the right, you see the feminine and masculine archetypes uh, coming together in what could be a marriage here in the middle. Um, so I have a couple other examples of that that I want to show in other decks um, in just a few moments. Uh, but that was the Rider Waite Smith deck. And those are the versions of the card that everybody's probably most familiar with. Um, so did either of you want to say anything about your experience of, yes, David has some cards to show too, um, the four of wands. Yeah, I also have this four of wands here from the Apocalypse of Tarot. I love this depiction. It has four uh, posts as the wands um, where this person's kind of throne um, is mounted on. It, it, they're sitting on, on kind of on some stairs as well. You see there's some light coming from above. So, so it shows the stability, shows the prestige. Um, it has some of those little Egyptian crosses, unkes, un unkes? Anks, yeah. Anks, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's how they call being thrown on him. And he is over some uh, animal skin, you know, luxury being represented here, also quadruped. Um, yeah, 
this is the depiction of the Apocalypse Tarot for the Four of Ones, with all those meanings that uh, Katie was uh, mentioning. This card also mentions in other ways, but it's very Martian. <laughs> it looks yeah. very Martian for what's really the wand, the yeah. wands coloring to it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really interesting with the Four of Wands. It has the flowers here in the bottom as well. Like it has uh, the Venusian touch to it. Mm -hmm. You see, but uh, it's less obvious than in the other card that yes. Katie was showing. Yeah, and the Four of Wands in the traditional Rider weight, you can see the Emperor and the Empress under these like wet, basically maypoles or like wedding pools, right? So it's definitely like a coming together of the energy at its, I guess, uh, at its most divine form. That's what it would represent is taking that kingdom of gold and forging the rings of unity where now it's not just I'm an individual or now it's not just I'm wow there's an other and there's something for me to respond to that allows me to know myself but now it's like um I guess being devoted to the other or being in harmony with the other the highest ideal of the other maybe something like this which I put the little golden rings in the um decanic image uh with that in mind with you know and of course because t susan chang gives us the explicit beauty weds the architect but i do really love again the way she puts that yeah the architect the architect it's very um you know the emperor is that architect really when you think about it it's the the force that builds things that exerts its will on the world so that's the architect but there yes. is then the counterpart to that, which is the fertile soil, the fertile land, um, the, the things that nourish to actually be able to build the structure. And that's the dynamic between the emperor and the empress. Yeah, absolutely. I wanna share another set of cards here, um, which is uh, from the mother peace deck. We did flash up the emperor on the left uh, during the last recording, but now it's paired with the Empress on the right. Um, and I think that looking at them as a pair is illuminating because they really do perfectly fit a Mars and Venus stereotype or archetype, I should say, right down to the colors, right, being used uh, as dominant themes throughout the cards. But what I wanted to um, do is read a little bit about this Empress card from the Mother Peace kind of companion book to this deck, um, which is really lovely and has uh, chapters on each um, major arcana card and each uh, suit or each grouping of the pips by number. Um, so this is from her chapter on the Empress. She says that uh, she is the archetypes of Ishtar and Aphrodite, Babylonian and Greek goddesses of love, as well as Demeter, the Greek grain goddess worshipped in the Eleusinian mysteries and later reflected in the Roman goddess series, which says the empress is the part of you who engages a partner or mothers a child. She is fundamentally in relation to others. In this image specifically, we have the naked woman reclining on the ground with a mirror, which is very interesting because even the reflection is an other. A classic, classic Venus symbol is the hand mirror like this along with the roses that grow around her feet. Um, there's some ancient uh, fertility symbols, uh, pregnancy figures in the background. Uh, there's a couple different ones there, I believe. And then on the bottom, you see the figure holding grain representing the agricultural goods uh, interspersed. There are some snakes wrapped around uh, those plants. Um, I think that might be a symbol related to, you know, the Shakti. Christian reception. yeah. Well, I mean, it could be Garden of Eden, but it's also right. Shakti. It's like Shiva Shakti, this name. Yeah. All right. And there are a few other car, uh, decks here that I also wanted to show the kind of suite of those three cards. The Empress on one side, the Four of Wands in the middle, and the Emperor on the other side. I like to think of this as, you know, looking at all these decks, different weddings, essentially. Uh, you see kind of more youthful versions of the rulers on either side. Uh, represented in the middle of the four of wands um so it's a really beautiful kind of story that you see uh through these three cards in particular that uh rule over aries three would you mind flashing up as long as we're looking at slides would you mind flashing up the ones that i sent you yeah sure 
Uh, let me skip to those. Here you go. Yeah, this with this Empress, I just I love the Venus symbol that she has at her feet on the first one on the uh, I, it would be your guys's left hand side, I think. Um, but what I really loved about this was almost it still has the wheat. So it still has that kind of like golden shafts of wheat. It might even harken to like that Vestal Virgin or like that that green goddess um, archetype. Um, but I loved the big full belly, like representing potential like pregnancy or the birth of the seed again, like that earth mother. And then I thought it was beautiful how they displayed the zodiac around her. So I wanted to show that today. And then we see that coming in the, like a little bit here in the Empress from the Hermetic deck, we see that sort of like spiraling and burning like DNA, which has that snake, again, like snake reference and the pillar reference from last time with the Phoenix. And again, we see the stars or maybe they're the planetary stars above the head of the Venusian character here. So I thought it was really cool how they kept that in this um, first card. They kept that symbolic stars of the zodiac uh, hovering Venus's head. And then just beautiful back to the Ankh, which I didn't know we were necessarily gonna talk about, but beautiful card for the Empress here and in the She-Wolf deck, they call it the Divine Feminine. So I just wanted to add a couple of images. Um, again, the rose with the Ankh. Um, I believe in the Rider Waite, they have like um, beads or something in her hair or crown uh, that display the 12 symbolic, yeah. they are symbolic of the 12 zodiac signs. In this case, you have 12 stars, 12 five pointed stars which are, you know, a, a symbol of Venus as well, the pentagram because of her star points forming a star pattern in the sky, this particular five-pointed star pattern. So, yeah, that's one representation of it, meaning that it, it is the multiple, the containing of all things, you know, the multiplicity that nature provides and that, um, you know, balanced with those energies, you know, it's just a life itself. Yes, and the pomegranates, the pomegranates on her dress, which are like one of those classic symbolic uh, things for this Deccan and for Venus, and that they have her spread on this queenly throne of Martian drapery, you know, you've got this red, like, strong action behind the growth or that she that support her, let's say that support her body. And I guess that's the idea of, like, some perfected union, right? Is the the support for um, for action to rise from? Yeah. Where is the emperor? Is that part of you that says um, something about like the strategic mind, the conscious mind, the self conscious mind, and stuff, um, and what it wants? You also have the empress being the awareness of what is what what you're able to get what's provided to you and how much that offers the security to your actions um and those archetypes together the empress i feel like is always challenged to um uphold the standards of the emperor but the emperor has to pay attention to the needs of the empress as well uh in that sense like the emperor uh notices what needs to be done and earthly terms, I mean, what's the ritual that needs to be followed? What's the kind of time that needs to be respected? What's the kind of uh, culture I need to learn to do certain types of things? But in the, in the case of the empress with the emperors, more like, what can I um, uh, sever from this multiple realm, from this abundant realm to give to my purposes? What is available? How much security that offers me? Um, yeah. Absolutely. And the, the abundance when the two come together that we see in the middle card here of that sort of like marriage, just the idea that we could delight in the union of something that actually represents our, our own divine nature. And I just love kind of the grapes falling and just that, again, now we have, you know, the purple here, but it's in the form of like earthly abundance and sweetness and wine and celebration. 
um, yeah, re celebrating that that ideal, I guess. We talked a little bit about the celebrating of the ideal as well with, with the sun card last time, but just, I guess here it represents kind of that union that society can um, look to where maybe everybody feels themselves represented in, in that ideal somehow. Yeah. No, the Four of Wands is actually um, one of those cards that really reinforces the suggestion to pay attention to the symbols in the image because it's so just in your face. It just looks like a card of union, of celebration. Um, I have a couple of other keywords for that card, so I'm gonna flip forward here. But one of the things that I found very interesting in um, reading about some of these different tarot cards, and that I think Cheng does reference in her book as well, is that um, there's an element of fours being a element, a, a period of peace before you know you are at a threshold. And you have to go on, go, go on on the adventure. You're not even at midway yet. You're not even at the five. So I really love to think of it that way and see in that definition and in both of these two cards in particular, Echoes of the Empress, because it is the more internal facing reflective energy. Um, you see in this deck here, which is the golden Renaissance tarot. Um, a mother and a child. It's very, very much in the theme of the Empress. I mean, if you just saw the image and didn't have the context, you might think it was the Empress card. Uh, but no, the Four of Wands here is speaking to that um, moment of, of refuge as well. And then on the left is the science deck, which I've uh, brought up a couple examples from before, but the uh, scientific principle or invention that is associated with um, the four of wands, or I should say the scientific discovery is that of the brown dwarf stars, which are, you know, they're on their path, they're on their way to becoming a regular star, but then something happens and they stop and they're in a period of stasis. Like they have, everything hasn't quite come together yet, but it's, it's kind of existing, you know, it's just floating out there. It's um, maybe not quite a celebration for the star, but it's a, a period of rest. It's not destroyed yet, but it's not moved forward yet. It's in that liminal space in between. It's interesting. It does speak to a, maybe a slight debility that Venus would have in this Aries decan as well, just like moving on towards brilliance, but, but needing a rest. So we're maybe celebrating our victories as well as, yeah, just that calm before the storm or just that uh, principle of like stop, rest, eat. Uh, you know, languid uh, in some wine and in the bedroom, maybe a little, yeah. or, you know, like <laughs> that honey glazed sweetness, right? That's, yeah. oh, I wanted to mention that uh, she, Chang, T. Susan Chang quotes Christopher Warnock in this chapter. And I really, really loved this quote. So he, he, he said, uh, describing this Deccan, um, this Deccan and this Venus spends like a drunken sailor. Uh, she might not be in great shape, but she knows how to throw one hell of a party. <laughs> Is that, uh, do you have anything else to add, Katie? Can we go for the Yavana Jataka and the Picatrix? Yes, please do. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to read real quick what it says here in the Picatrix. Um, first of all, the color of this uh, Deccan is white, according to it. Uh, for magical purposes, rituals and things, if you guys want to do it, it's the color white that they're indicating. Uh, and it's a Venusian color as well as a lunar color, uh, nocturnal sect, uh, kind of benefic planets. So that makes sense. And what it says here is that there rises in the third face of Aries, a restless man holding in his hands a gold bracelet, wearing a red clothing, who, who wishes to do good, but is not able to do it. Uh, this is a face of subtlety and subtle mastery and new thing, new things and instruments and similar things. This is its form. So again, wishes to do good, but is not able to do it. Uh, face of subtlety and subtle mastery, um, new things and instruments. So subtlety with Venus, mastery with Mars is Mars being like perseverance through uh, trying to stabilize or having that uh, passion that you're following or something like that uh, with both Mars and Venus in that case. Um, 
I find it interesting that uh, it's uh, trying to do good, but it's not able to do it, which is that Venus and ability kind of quality. Like I try to harmonize things, but I'm using Mars material. So the harmony that I cause is long-term maybe necessary that I, that I do these things for harmony, but it's not harmonious like, when, I, when I take these actions like that, you know? Like having to defend yeah that. I mean it just kind of reminds me of like I mean this is kind of like an olden day like vision I'm getting but it's like you're out for blood and you're out for war and then you've conquered this kingdom or something like this or you've made this you've built this thing and it's like this big party when you get back from like whatever it is making the deal or the battlefield or whatever and it's like we might want to be to our better natures but we're not we're all just like you know, free love, getting drunk, like doing our thing, just like hooking up, whatever. It's just kind of this YOLO because it's Mars first, right? So it's just kind of like, let's get in there. Let's drink, let's feast, let's be merry. Like maybe even to like our detriment in certain ways or certain instances. I think one way I hear about um, kind of this relationship between the host, like the, the Lord of the sign, the ruler of the sign, and then the uh, Lord of the Deccan is um, as though uh, Venus has quarters or apartments in the temple or the house of Mars, uh, but she's still not totally comfortable there. So it's like the group house that you don't really want to be in. Um, again, party time for Venus, just not exactly where she wants to be, but at least it's fun. Yeah, and I think of that like too when it said like dancers and comedians and then you've got the feast and then you've got like the, you add the Venusian archetype to a martial thing and you have like, you know, women and ornaments and food and dancing and all kinds of crazy debauchery. Um, I also wanna add that, um... I think of an archetype of Venus in Aries in particular, um, or Venus in Aries mix, or Venus in her ability as the new version of the Wonder Woman movies by Marvel that, that came out. That might sound kind of silly, but I really liked it when I saw it in the theaters back when it came out, the first movie of this new series, uh, because it was this idea that she was fighting against the god of war, so it's basically, uh, and she's this woman that's trying to subdue this god of war because she's like, okay, if war is a problem, we must kill the god of war. <laughs> uh, and if war is, if, if you know the god of war is causing all these troubles, then we should go straight for it and try to subdue him. Uh, but it's his own terrain, you know, war itself, going to war against him is using his own energy, which empowers that particular deity in a way. So. How can she do that? And until the end, she's challenged with, with that particular question. How can I do that uh, when in his own battle, you know, in his own game, it seems like the war is won because it's human nature uh, to not think of the collective as this one thing, but, but, you know, split and just be, but she brings in that, no, you can fight for what is right. You, you know, you can still um, go to the, to the, uh, beyond the limits for the collective. You know, you don't need to go only for your own view uh, of things. You can go uh, to those extremes that the previous decans perhaps were going for the collective, which is more challenging perhaps. Um, absolutely, yeah. like I love that. I absolutely love that idea and that image of Wonder Woman because it kind of reminds me of the early archetypes of uh, the Venus Aphrodite like character, which is like the horned huntress, right? where that really speaks to this for me is like a wild, unbridled uh, huntress with, you know, some kind and of like build not this quite love story. Go ahead. They, they, sorry, they build this, this love story in the movie that is uh, quite, you know, Hollywood's uh, style, but you have still this, uh, 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 this archetypal image of the Venus in Aries where the lover is sacrificed for the ideal and you know, pleasure is sacrificed for the ideal that is turned into uh, to, towards the collective and towards you know we are friends, but I, and we want to have this relationship. But I understand that I have to give up on this Venusian thing for the bigger collective picture uh, in Which, this manner. So I think that's very to the 
it, yeah, it speaks to it, but to the detriment, I mean, I think just that idea that you were describing just kind of speaks to the detriment of the feminine also a lot of times. Do you know what I mean? Like having to give a part of herself or give up on this or that in order to fill this ideal of the collective to the feminine's detriment, perhaps, you know? Um, when we just think of- Because you lose your, your, your capacity to be multiple and to be multivalent and to- hold space for everything that you can hold space for in order to define yourself as this one tiny little thing that society wants you to be you know uh and so yeah i can i can totally see that imagery that you brought up yeah just because like the kind of the the primal huntress was also the divine mother you know but that became like way too much <laughs> for the archetype to hold at some point and to the detriment of, of women in general and we can see that in modern society and throughout you know the kind of fall of uh, feminine, divine feminine paganism into the sort of like patriarchy that we've been referring to uh, in previous seconds. So we can see that as a challenge and a um, opportunity to rise to the, to the archetype of the huntress and the wonder woman um, archetype of that pure, uh, fierce, unbridled, feminine and with that could we give some examples of people that have uh the sun in aries 3 i, I brought some of those up awesome. the first one that i want to draw is pope benedict the 16th the one that uh, resigned his post a few years back uh, that gave way for pope francis and the the interesting imagery here is that the tarot card associated with taurus which is the next sign we're going to cover with the deccans is the Hierophant and that card or the Pope and that card in particular um, is here represented in that sense of the Pope resigning his post initially due to ill health, which is a Martian signification, but also um, behind the scenes, you had this speculation, which, you know, several sources of the BBC and, and other um, major vehicles said were confirmed that Pope Benedict were, was, not, was having some power struggles within the Vatican, and uh, there were power struggles within the, the whole structure itself. He and was this is a, a the pretty... whole religion under attack, right? Yeah, For, yeah. and so it's Islam. pretty big. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty big event to have that kind of rupture in such a stable thing, right, such as the Catholic Church tries to portray us. Uh, and again, that symbol of Venus not being able to do its work, the Pope trying to be religiously pious in his own view, not being able to, not being able to exert the kind of power he expected he would have and having to part ways with that power structure uh, in order to uphold his own uh, views, um, which is a very, uh, you know, I, I, I uphold this in, 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 as a representative, I, th I think it's a a good thing to depart from the structure as well, if need it be. So I, I feel like that's a good example. With, without value judgment, I'm just uh, attributing uh, you know, the characteristics of the planets here being manifested. Also, uh, Natalie Desay, Desay, Desso, Desay, Desso, I don't know how to say her name, but uh, she is a singer, uh, an opera singer, um, and she is what we call coloratura, which is um, very high, you know, kind of high, a very high pitched voice. It can reach very high notes. And uh, that's kind of Martian as well, I feel like. Very high pitched notes, sharp notes in other words. Um, and she's one of the most famous uh, nowadays. Um, she's got a really just, beautiful voice. She's just a comment tall. on that, like that is archetypally amazing. I love that, an opera singer. That opera singer, is, right? Venus and Mars, very sharp. That is everything, right? Just this absolutely shattering voice. Yes. Nice. And Charles Chaplin as well. So actor representing Adolf Hitler, like uh, the dictator, like mocking um, that, that image as well. And you have that, um, again, through art, and mockery being like a margin, also a kind of action in order to bring awareness around the topic. You have him inter uh, uh, impersonating these roles of workers and people who are represented 
uh, by Mars, the common people, you know, and, and and showing that reality in a comical under a comical light. Well, yeah, uh, like arts. Austin said, uh, dancers, comedians, performers, the arts in general. So yeah, we get that comedic relief. Um, that well, another thing about him though too is that he had a really interesting love life in which oh, yes. he pursued very young women. Um, I think he had married four times, most of the time to women in their teens, no matter how old he got. His last wife, he uh, married, he was 52 and she was like 17 or something. Um, so again, we're talking about things that I think are really important because even though Venus is a benefic, Venus isn't always great. Yeah. <laughs> like there's yeah. some, there's no. some other stuff in there. She, she sometimes curses people who are prettier than her. <laughs> <laughs> also, just the idea of like okay. subjugation again, right? So if Venus takes detriment in Mars's sign, it's like when Mars has this has control in this malefic sense, it's a malefic. It's like, yeah, Venus is young and beautiful women. And Mars is the subjugation of or the um, taking advantage of or abusing, again, the word abuse, um, those Venusian gifts yes um victoria beckham and kate hudson are the other two names that i got so uh, there, there were actually a lot of female actresses on the like list that i had as well and so grouping those two in kate hudson victoria beckham well i guess she's not an actress but a pop sensation well victoria beckham also married a sportsman she married a sportsman. There you go. That's that's her Mars. A famous one, yeah. But we also have Shannon Doherty, Emma Watson, who is Hermione Granger, and America Ferreira. And all these, mm -hmm. these are, you know, beautiful women that have acted and um, acted and performed in many different venues. But the interesting thing about them that I think would be worth looking into is, so they have a little bit of a girl next door image, but then there's something subversive. There's something different about them and their path that has made them a little bit more like um, you question the archetypes of how much of the girl next door or of the feminine she really is. Um, Shannon Doherty is probably the best example of that. You know, she has had um, some tabloid drama, um, honestly, before I was old enough to read the tabloids, but I hear that she used to have a very dramatic, you know, aggressive attitude towards the people that she worked with. Um, so that's the most Mars yet Venusian person, I think, on that list. I like that Emma Watson also, rep, rep, like, is the modern beauty and the beast, like Bella archetype, yeah. because that's a totally fitting image, I think. Beauty and the Beast in general is kind of a fitting kind of thing, yes. where Belle was, you know, taken as Stockholm syndrome and shit. Oh yeah, right. Trauma bonding. <laughs> Trauma bonding. <laughs> Trauma bonding. Um, but yeah, like just taken as a captive, but then, you know, falling in love with a beast who wasn't actually this Martian beast, but like his better qualities were brought out, but only through her. And this, it is a very uh, good symbolism for this. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the emoji, my favorite part. Let's drop in a rose. Let's drop in a flame. If we can do the rose and flame together, we've got the flaming rose. We can hit it with that. You also could, I don't know, on some, we get the, the wedding rings or the gold ring. You could drop that in the emojis below. You could get creative with it. But I like the uh, burning rose uh, drop. So drop a rose, drop a flame. Let us know you're here. And one last thing I want to comment because I, I I I like to do these things like remember last minute comments about the the whole archetypal imagery, um, like the burning rose thing just reminded me of the War of the Roses where you had two houses that had roses as their standards uh, fighting against each other to see who would occupy the throne of England back in the day, and you have the um, uh, um, the battle being between two branches of basically the same family um, that's been out. Like, and, and, and it's kind of weird how that symbolizes the power dynamic in Aries, but also what's the collective structure, the dynasty basically that's gonna occupy power. Uh, it's not a single individual, it's a whole political uh, party basically, or a, a set of interests that uh, follow those particular leaders that are gonna occupy power. Uh, for the next decades. Um, 
Yeah. I love that. Like the, the idea of dynasty, I feel like has some sort of significance here as well with the emperor and the empress, you know, like when they come together, what happens if they successfully, you know, unite and lead the country, they start a dynasty. So that's mm-hmm. a pretty interesting historical example. I like it. Yeah. And, you know, just the rose in general, every rose having its thorns, you know? So with the flames of war, Austin says, so surges the heart. So in closing, let's just go over what we've got for our contacts or any bits of news. David, do you have anything? Um, Nothing too new. We have our own going series on the Deccans as well, shorter versions of these videos where we go through bullet points and we get a little deeper into some tarot meanings with an expert. Generally, it's going to be D. He is the... um, uh, resident tarot reader in our uh, group here, but we are also going to have some guests coming in every now and then, especially when Dee uh, cannot make it uh, for that particular decan. So this next time we're gonna have a friend of mine from Brazil coming in with her own intake on the three of ones for uh, the Aries two decan, so stay tuned for that. And we are going to follow up with the Aries three decan uh, in the next um, installment. Yeah, and we also got the Astro Collective going on. If you guys want to check that out on Facebook, um, my page is in the first place. Uh, You can find me at in the first place astrology.com or in my Instagram at the same handle. Yeah, and I forgot, I can't even believe that I forgot to mention this right off the top. So not only are we having like a little sub this week for D um, with the tarot on the short clips, which I, I still just love that we're doing these like short clips. So if you are here, but you're thinking these are long and it takes you a week to get through them, hop over and watch the short clips. But the other thing that I was going to mention is that it's pretty apropos that um, Katie will be taking just a little bit of a rest, a little, maybe a vacay for the next decade. So we've got a super exciting guest for the Taurus one decade, another YouTuber, another astrologer, another good friend. So um, we won't see you next time, Katie, but you'll be back after Taurus one and we will see our surprise guest. I'm not sure if I should mention, although I did get a confirmation that they no, no, but keep it, it keep it secret. Keep it secret. Let, let, oh, let's keep, 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 secret, keep it safe. Okay, we'll yeah. build the suspense for our, our guests next <laughs> week. That's going to ring in um, or next, maybe, yeah, next decade, next week, um, ring in Taurus one with us. All right. Do we'll you want to lead us out again with the poem from T. Susan Chang references in her um, book? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yes, I will miss you all next decan, but I do need some Torian indulgence uh, holiday time. So it's... I'm so happy for you. We're <laughs> like supporting that a thousand. And, and again, just to mention, because we didn't, uh, KD is at kddayton.com. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. And I'm open for reading, so reach out when you can. Um, Okay, so this is the uh, poem at the end of her chapter. Uh, This is by Lucille Clifton, and it's called There is a Girl Inside. There is a girl inside. She is randy as a wolf. She will not walk away and leave these bones to an old woman. She is a green tree in a forest of kindling. She is a green girl in a used poet. She has waited patient as a nun for the second coming, when she can break through gray hairs into blossom. And her lovers will harvest honey and thyme, and the woods will be wild with the damn wonder of it. 